Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Anita Thompson, and I am the North American Account uh, Executive for Matific Math. I am so pleased to join to have you join us today for this webinar, Using Games to Transform K-5 Mathematics <laughs> Education, presented by Professor Shimon Shokan. And then just a little more about our speaker today. I'm so pleased that Shimon could join us. Shimon Shokan is the founding dean and professor at the School of Computer Science at IDC Herzliya. He also taught at NYU, Harvard, and Stanford and was chairperson of the Israeli Ministry of Education's Computer Science Committee. The courses that Shimon has developed have been adopted by over 400 universities and are listed in Coursera's top rated courses. His work is described in a best-selling MIT press book and in popular TED Talks. He is co-founder and academic director of a programming boot camp for learners from underprivileged backgrounds, a project that won two Google EDU innovation grants. Shimon is also the co-founder of Matific, whose interactive math teaching games are used in over 60 countries. I, I guarantee you will learn something today. Um, I love the way that Shimon frames and discusses mathematics, teaching, and learning. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Shimon. Over to you, Shimon. And remember to post your questions under the question mark, and we'll cover those in the Q&A. So I'll leave you now and, and uh, catch up with you again at the end of the presentation to moderate the Q&A. Thanks, everyone. Great. So once again, pleasure to be here. And... Uh... As uh, the introduction uh, mentioned, I, I wear uh, several uh, hats. Uh, under one of them, I'm part of a group that developed thousands of games that uh, teach mathematics in uh, uh, elementary school uh, classes. And uh, wearing another hat, I teach computer science in uh, several uh, universities. And I'd like to start with a few words about uh, actually my computer science work which uh, is, is very much related also to what I do in mathematics. And so uh, let me start with this slide. And uh, typically uh, computer scientists or computer science professors are fond of showing a slide like this with uh, you know, many uh, fancy uh, logos. And then they go on to say that uh, graduates of their programs are working in, uh, in all these uh, companies. Well, in my case, I'm quite proud to say that every one of these companies has acquired at least one startup company that was developed by one of my students. And in some cases, like Google and Microsoft, it was uh, two and three companies. And uh, I would like to think that uh, something that I do in my teaching uh, contributes to this uh, success, contributes to the fact that uh, uh, my students end up being uh, highly uh, curious and uh, entrepreneurial and creative. And I would like to think that it's it's related to the way we teach them computer science and mathematics. And so I'm going to spend uh, uh, quite a bit of time in this talk talking about the pedagogy that I use uh, both in computer science and in uh, mathematics and in putting together all these games. So uh, in addition to teaching regular courses, I also teach online courses, as was mentioned. And uh, two courses that I teach in Coursera are now being taken by about uh, 200,000 students. And every week I get an email from uh, Coursera saying that uh, about 1,000 new students enroll to my courses. And this is really staggering when you think about it, because when I teach in my university, I end up teaching or reaching about 100 students uh, a year. And uh, if I will continue with this rate for the next uh, 20 years or so, optimistically uh, speaking, I will end up teaching maybe uh, 2,000 students in, uh, in my university and about a million students in Coursera. So in order, you know, in order to reach a million students in my university, I will have to teach about 10,000 years. And I'm mentioning these numbers because, you know, these are the new realities that, that we face in, um, in online education and in education technology. We can take courses and, and disseminate them to huge audiences and, uh, and, and, and people all over the world 
which, you know, still for me difficult to sort of take for granted. So in many uh, situations, I'm being called upon uh, either in seminars or keynote speech, speeches and so on to say a few words about, you know, how do you build a great online course? And uh, my answer to this question consists of uh, uh, two bullets. If you want to build a great uh, online course, you have to have a great course and then put it online. And what I'm trying to say by this, what I'm trying to emphasize is that pedagogy is the most important success factor. You know, all the uh, nice uh, bells and whistles that we get with online learning are also terribly important, but if you don't have pedagogy, if you don't know what you want to teach and how you want to teach it, uh, you're not going to make it. So pedagogy wins the game. And when it comes to math teaching games, it's exactly the same principle. It's first and foremost pedagogy, and then on top of this, obviously, you need engagement, you, you need uh, uh, a playful uh, user experience, you need uh, to sort of uh, microcast or personalize uh, the treatment that every uh, child gets, you need to provide on ongoing uh, feedback. But once again, all these things, in my opinion at least, are secondary to the great pedagogy which underlies a great uh, educational technology product. So it all starts with teachers, with people like you, with people like me, who uh, sit somewhere in some uh, coffee house or some coffee shop and, uh, and talk and think about how to teach some mathematical subject, how to teach fractions, fraction division, fraction addition, you know, how to teach uh, some geometrical subject. It all starts from there, from back of the envelope, drawings and ideas. That's the most important part in my experience uh, in uh, in developing a great game, the conceptual understanding of the subject matter. Now, why are we focusing on mathematics? Well, uh, we do so because we have to think about the future. And uh, so I'd like to say a few words about the future. And before doing so, I'm reminded by uh, this warning from Mark Twain, who said that predictions are always difficult, you know, especially those that deal with the future. And that's a very wise advice, you know, just thinking, think about, you know, people who made predictions three years ago and, you know, no one could foresee what uh, uh, sort of the, the drama that will happen uh, in the world uh, since uh, COVID. And so all these predictions are now, uh, uh, you know, not terribly useful. So instead of trying to predict what will happen, let me try to say a few words about what will not change in the next few years. What will not change is that we will still need plenty of engineers, scientists, developers, and entrepreneurs. And in order to succeed in any one of these professions, you must have a strong foundation in mathematics. You know, mathematics is like the queen and mistress of, of all sciences, of all technologies, of, of numerous different professions. Now, when you look at a typical classroom in uh, North America or in Israel uh, or practically anywhere else, well, maybe two students in, in, in the class will end up studying some quantitative uh, uh, reasoning uh, topics, you know, that will lead them into being scientists or, or engineers. And everyone else, you know, will go on studying things like uh, business, law, graphics design, and whatnot. And, you know, all these professions are very important, but the tragedy is that many of the students that go on to study business, law, and so on, could have been great scientists and great engineers. And they didn't end up pursuing this career choice because at some point, very early on in their education, they had a trauma with math education. And so... In this classroom, for example, if you look at these two students, they will understand perhaps about 90, 80% of what is going on in a typical math class. And all the remaining students will be kind of swimming. 
you know, some of them will understand 60%, some 20%, some 50%. And this is unlike other subjects. You know, when you think about reading and writing, the situation is much better. And it's not, it's not so, it doesn't have this incredible variance. You know, students normally understand most of what is going on in, in other classes. But in math, you have this incredible variety and it's very difficult, you know, for the teacher to, to address every one of these students uh, individually. Not to mention that the teacher herself probably understands only about 60% of what is going on when you discuss something like fraction division. So uh, this is a worldwide phenomena and uh, you know, teachers are not to blame because most of the teachers who teach mathematics don't have uh, uh, training in, uh, in math in, in university or college level. And, and so everyone is struggling. And uh, as a result, many students become resentful toward mathematics early on in their education and it typically happens when uh, you start to deal with fractions. Up until fractions, students are happy, and then at some point, the trauma begins. And the trauma begins because of uh, advices uh, like this one. You know, don't ask why, just invert and multiply. And you know, this advice is guaranteed to give you the correct answer, but the poor student have, has no idea why this answer is actually correct and why this strategy actually works. And when it comes to geometry, you find you know, very similar uh, rules and procedures like uh, here's a clue, multiply base times height and uh, divide by two. And this will lead to all sorts of uh, problem sets in which you have uh, some uh, algorithm at the top, some rule to follow, and all sorts of instances of this rule, and you have to apply them uh, uh, to this, uh, or to apply the rule to these, uh, 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 you know, different cases. And the problem with this uh, style of learning is that this is not mathematics. You know, this is robotics. This is actually, it's, it's not even education, it's counter-education. You turn students into automatons who get some rules and then they follow these rules. And in fact, the calculator will do a much better job than, than a human in, in following such rules. So now I'm not saying that you don't have to practice uh, these rules. Of course you do. And, and you have to do problem sets. It's, it's, it's a very important part of your education but you have to do it only after you understand the subject matter, only, only after you understand why the rule actually works. So, you know, so far I talked only about negative examples. Let's, uh, let's see a positive one. Let's see, what, is it, what, what does it take to build uh, mathematical excellence? Well, it takes a picture like this. And if you want to teach students how to calculate the area of a triangle, start with a picture like this, and then you know, move this triangle around. And uh, just go a few more iterations like this. And at some point, maybe you want to draw this line and then ask the students, what do you think is the relationship between the beige area and the blue area. And if you don't see it right away, well, maybe you want to look at half of the picture. What is the relationship between these two areas? Well, obviously they're equal. Well, let's look at the other part of the picture. What about this part of the image? Once again, the two areas are equal. So if we put these two observations together, we get that the beige area is the same as the blue area. And it doesn't matter, you know, where the, uh, uh, the top of this uh, rectangle lies. In every one of these examples, the blue area equals the beige area. And it becomes strikingly vivid when you go all the way to the edge of the rectangle. And at that point, you can say, well, this is height, this is base, and obviously, we have just shown 
in a very vivid way that the triangle area is half uh, uh, the size or half uh, the magnitude of the rectangular area. And this is how you build understanding. You build it in games like this. Well, that, this is not exactly a game, but it's an idea for a game. It's a defining concept that can be used to develop a game. And that's what we do. We take concepts like this and we build games around them. Because mathematics, at the end of the game, if you ask mathematicians what is mathematics, mathematics is playful exploration. It's playing with patterns and structures. And, uh, you know, some of these patterns and structures are physical. Some of them are abstract. And you try to apply all sorts of insights and, uh, and, uh, and comprehension. And you do this by playing with these structures and by doing what I call hands-on discovery. It's very important that the student will discover this th these things on his or her own, using their own devices. So you don't want to just you know, sit there or stand in classroom and, and write a mathematical rule or some law. You want the students to discover this law on their own. And of course, you want to guide them in this process. The teacher is terribly important. And uh, <clears throat> as, as we just saw. Now, unfortunately, today, in many places, mathematics is taught like this. Once again, problem sets and you know, more problem sets and more problem sets. And, you know, we all have traumas from these problem sets, right? And, uh, you know, about 20 years ago, educational technology kicked in. But unfortunately, up until now, most or many educational uh, technology product looks like this, right? So, you know, it's the same thing with uh, a few bells and whistles. And, uh, you know, children are not uh, uh, difficult to fool. And, uh, and therefore, at some point, you're going to get this attitude when you try to use these so-called educational technology tools that do nothing more than dress up a problem set in some fancy user interface. So that's not learning. You know, this is just, once again, this is robotics. And uh, if this is what you want to teach, if, if what you want to teach is, uh, is addition, then... You know, there are numerous other ways to do it creatively and playfully. And let me show you what we do. So this is one out of thousands of games that we developed and out, one out of something like 30 games that we developed to teach uh, addition. So we start with this game in which the, uh, the task is to create uh, a necklace or a bracelet using x number of beads, in this case, five beads. So that's the only instruction that the student gets. And then the student will probably come up with an answer like this. And if this is the answer, at some point we might say, great, now you know, try to use both kinds of beads instead of just uh, uh, one of them. And uh, the student will come up with something like this. Excellent answer, five beads. And uh, at some point we might say, now trying, you know, try using only one start bead. And the student might come up with something like this. Or we may even say, try to put the single bead in the middle. And uh, now try to use uh, more start beads than green beads and so on. You know, if, if you want to emphasize uh, the notion of more or less. And so what have we learned from this uh, experience? Well, uh, from this setting, we learned that two plus three equals five, or we, we can cause, we can sort of stage this learning in, in, in many different ways in this game. And uh, we also learned that three plus two also equals five because you can count from the left, you can count from the right, it doesn't matter, right? And uh, from this setting, we learned that uh, four plus one equals five, but we also learned that two plus one plus two also equals five. And uh, from this uh, situation, from this solution, which looks like the most trivial one, 
Well, from this one, we can learn something quite uh, deep. We can learn that five plus zero also equals five, right? Five striped or starred beads plus zero green beads equals five beads altogether. And so the teacher or the parent or uh, whoever is around can cause, you know, the word cause is too strong here, but can sort of create a situation in which different children come up with different answers. It happens on its own. You don't have to really uh, uh, engineer it. It, it. it just happens that you get multiple correct answers. And that's great because there is so much to be learned from comparing and discussing many different correct solutions. And by the way, you know, we didn't, we, we never mentioned the word addition, right? We just said, you know, create a necklace. And so you can take a child who only knows counting and begin with this game, which is actually, it looks like a counting game, but actually it's also an addition game in disguise, right? And you see in, in mathematics, everything is interrelated and addition is actually, or it can be thought of as an extension of counting because what does it mean to add three plus two? It means that you count to three and then you go on counting to two and you get five, okay? And what does it mean to subtract two from five? It's, it's to find the number that when you add to two, you get five. So subtraction sort of emerges also from addition. Everything is interrelated. So for every one of these elementary operations, we have dozens of games that, that, that train and practice to understand these abstract notions in many different settings. You know, one of them is making uh, bracelets and, and there are many other uh, examples that I will show you uh, later on in the talk. Now, here's another example coming from a geometric domain and uh, a much later stage. This is uh, probably a third or fourth grade. And here, or maybe a later grade, I'm not sure. And here the instruction is to create two trapezoids using all the shapes that appear on the screen. Now we give the student scissors and glue and the student is welcome to cut, you know, whatever uh, uh, she or he wants and to rotate things and glue them together and come up with the right answer. So this is hands-on learning more than anything else. Here's an example in which we teach children in kindergarten or in first grade, the notion of parity. You know, the notion of, you know, the difference between odd and even, which I think is terribly important to teach early on in your education because it creates a foundation for division. You know, division is notoriously known to be difficult. So the earlier you understand what does it mean to be odd or even, you know, the earlier you begin to create a foundation that will later on accommodate uh, the notion of division. So we do this by, you know, introducing a flock of birds. And uh, the question is, you know, is the number of birds odd or even? Now the student can explore the scene and the student can, you know, take these birds and pair them up any way uh, he or she wants. And, you know, once you pair them up, you see right away if there's an odd bird remaining outside this uh, pairing, in which case it's odd, otherwise it's even. And we have several such games that uh, once again uh, uh, show uh, uh, this notion of, of parity. And I often you know, hear uh, people say, why do we teach, why, why do you think that you, know, you have to teach parity in such an early age? Well, I explained it before, but in general, Here's something that I truly believe in. And this is a quote from uh, a great psychologist who once said, any subject can be taught effectively in some intellectually honest way to any child at any stage of development. 
And this is a very important insight. You know, you can take highly complex ideas and instead of teaching, you know, the whole complexity, zero in on the defining notion, on the most important thing that you want to communicate and build a game around it. And, and we do it all the time in our uh, portfolio of games. And I normally te uh, tell the parents, you know, many friends ask me, you know, how early is it uh, to begin playing with your games, with, with, uh, with learning mathematics? And I tell them, you know, once the child begins to hear some numbers mentioned uh, at home, he or she is ready. So when you say something like, let's keep half of the cake for tomorrow, the child is ready. He or she can start playing uh, mathematical games. <clears throat> Here's a game in which we teach uh, fractions. And uh, we do so by, once again, you have to understand, this is one out of a family of about 20 games that teach fractions. And uh, or just the concept, of what does it mean to be a fraction? So we do it with pizza pies in this particular setting. So we show some pizza pies and uh, we tell the student, uh, we guide them to uh, to top the pizza pies or parts of the pizza pies with the broccoli or mushrooms or whatever it is. So uh, in order to do so, we begin by cutting the pizza pies into uh, equal slices. And then, you know, if we have 10 slices, Two of them should be topped with the broccoli in, in one pizza and in the other pizza, uh, half of them or five of them should be covered and so on. So once again, the notion of a fraction, which is you know a very abstract notion, becomes concrete if you use real life examples. And uh, the cutting and the topping are kind of fun. You know, all these games are kind of casual games which are fun to play with. Here's a game in which we teach the notion of uncertainty and uh, the beginning of probabilistic reasoning. So what we do in this game is we put this child at sort of an intersection in the road in which uh, she's facing two different possibilities. And in every one of, of, these, uh, of these roads, there's some object that, uh, that should be considered. So on the top uh, uh, road, we see some flowers. And at the bottom, uh, of, of the, uh, at the bottom road, we see a butterfly. Now, you don't see it in this example, but the butterfly keeps on flying from one road to the other. So, you know, at some point he, the butterfly is here, at some point the butterfly is on the other, <coughs> other road and so on. And, and the flowers, of course, are stationary. So we ask the child, uh, will I see blue flowers if I take road two? The answer, of course, should be no way. But what about the butterfly? Well, the butterfly is a maybe, right? So this is, once again, the beginning of, of understanding these highly abstract notion of certainly, maybe, certainly not, and so on. And we bring these abstractions home by creating a real life situation that the child can connect to. And we do it in every one of our games. So, you know, here's a game in which we, we try to sort of uh, get two objectives uh, in, in, in the same game. And what we do here is we show a scatter plot. This is a, a fifth grade, I think it's a fifth grade uh, uh, game in which we uh, play with scatter plots. But uh, we use this opportunity of uh, uh, playing with scatter plots to also teach the notion of average. And, you know, there are many different ways to explain what is an average, but one way to explain average in an active hands-on way is to start with this uh, scatter plot and try to move these data points around in order to create a uniform distribution. And you can do so. You can, you can click you know, different uh, objects and move them around and try to create you know, a bunch of uh, columns that have the same height. 
And once you do it, you feel in, in literally in your fingers, at the tips of your fingers, you understand what is average because you, you created it. You literally built the concept of average hands-on. <clears throat> so once again, you know, whenever we present something, we, we try to sort of squeeze, you know, or sort of get as much mileage as we can from every one of these games. And by doing so, we create connections between, you know, different, different ideas and different techniques in mathematics, which is very, very important. Here's a game in which um, uh, this is more of a literacy game uh, in which we just try to uh, have the child practice the notion of right triangles. So there are a bunch of triangles here and you have to click uh, the ones that have a right angle. And if you make a mistake, uh, something uh, bad happens. And if you get the right answer, well, if you, if you um, make a, a bad choice, you get another triangle triangle kicking into the game and so on. So once again, uh, instead of just, you know, boring uh, problem sets, why not doing, uh, doing it using a game? Here's a game which is also a kind of a problem set. And uh, what we do here is we show a family who is uh, you know, walking around uh, uh, in the outdoor, and all sorts of animals and insects are uh, milling around. And uh, when the student clicks on one of these uh, insects, he gets um, effect, uh, a factual uh, statement. And so um, it turns out that the mosquito lives about 10 days. And the question is, how many hours does a mosquito typically live? So obviously, you know, this is a question that uh, uh, asks the students to multiply. And yet the multiplication is done in a very lively context and it has a purpose. You know, it's not just a problem set. It's, uh, it is done in order to answer an interesting question. And once again, notice how all these mathematical issues are rooted in a real life context, which is terribly important because mathematics is abstract. And the only way to understand things abstractly, unless you're a genius, you know, geniuses can, uh, you know, play chess by, by walking together and just uh, calling out positions without even seeing the board. But most people cannot do that. And most people have to relate if I take myself, for example, whenever I'm trying to understand an abstract notion, what do I do? I start with concrete examples and I play with many concrete examples and then I extrapolate from the concrete examples to the abstract. And that's what we try to do with all these games. <clears throat> now, at some point, we also want to, to practice uh, technique. And uh, by technique, I mean literacy and uh, the ability to solve problems quickly without necessarily uh, getting into, once again, uh, the underlying conceptual understanding. Because we do this in other games. So what I'm trying to say is that we begin with games that explain the concepts and build confidence. It's terribly important that the student will apply some algorithm or some rule only after he or she convinced themselves that they understand why the rule works. But once they understand that the rule works, you want to begin practicing. You want to sort of teach them to think uh, quickly on their feet. So in this example here, uh, students have to skip by three. So, you know, one way of skip, skipping by three is just writing down a series like three, six, nine, 12, 15, boring, right? Boring and, uh, and uh, uninteresting. So instead, we have a nice uh, board game in which there's an avatar and uh, the avatar has to jump from one stage to another. And in every stage, the avatar can go from 15 to 20, which is a wrong move. You want to skip by three. 
but the avatar can also go from 15 to 18, which is the correct answer. So you keep hopping from one stage to another until you get some prize. And so once again, practice is important, but you know, let's do it lively. Let's do it playfully. Why not? Uh, another example of a practice game, you know, here we want to practice the ability to add up numbers quickly. And once again, we do it with a game which looks a little bit like a Mario Brothers game, but with birds instead of uh, uh, Mario and his uh, uh, brother and so on. And so I want to emphasize once again that I'm, I'm not trying to, to say that practice is not important. Practice is very important. You know why? You know, why do we want to teach, for example, uh, the multiplication table by heart? Not because it's terribly important to, to remember that uh, five times seven is 35. It's not terribly important, but it's important to be able to solve it very quickly so that you will have the ability to think about more important things, right? And, um, and therefore, both modes of learning are, I shouldn't say equally important because each has a very different merit but understanding and practice both uh, uh, should be done. And, and, and we have uh, uh, numerous games that, uh, that emphasize both of these sides of, of, of the same coin, which is mathematics education. So, you know, I mentioned uh, uh, multiplication table. So we have very nice games. In this case, it's a, it's a card game. It looks a little bit like a memory game that teach, uh, teaches the... Uh, multiplication table in, in a very engaging way. Here's another game that teaches the notion of the decimal system. And, uh, you know, the game here is, is very simple, but the, but the user experience is kind of fun. And uh, you have to actually try it in order to uh, realize that. But uh, because the birds make it a little bit difficult to sort of it's difficult to catch them and it's kind of funny uh, uh, to uh, try to catch these birds and put them in the bird house. And the only question here is how many birds do you see? And as the students begin to put the birds into the uh, uh, bins here, we encourage them to first of all fill in one of these bird houses and only then begin to fill in the other bird house. And this sort of gives you once on once again a hands-on understanding of the difference between tens and units. And once again, we do it uh, in a playful way, which is the whole idea of, of our portfolio of games. And there are numerous other examples. Uh, you know, here we teach subtraction. It's it's a real fun game. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the whole. Uh, a demo in front of you, but it begins with a bunch of cherries uh, located on, on some plates. And then uh, a monster comes in and eats some of these cherries and uh, a few cherries remain. And the question is, how many cherries did the monster eat? So at the beginning, you record how many cherries you had before the monster came, then you record how many you have now. And the difference is the answer to this question. And here's another question that, uh, or another game that play, uh, deals with uh, counting. And uh, in this game, there's a sort of beautiful picture that you can uh, uh, scroll horizontally. And uh, what we try to teach here is counting over space, so to speak. So we ask a question like, you know, how many birds do you see or how many birds are there in this picture? And in this part of the picture, we see four, and then you begin to scroll and you see another one and maybe another two and so on. And you have to sort of keep on registering all these additions in your mind and come up with the right answer. Another example of a counting uh, scenario. In this game, we teach the notion of symmetry and we do it as usual in a hands-on fashion. So we show half of an image and we give the child, you know, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, sort of chiclets uh, that, that they can play with. 
and uh, and we ask them to complete the picture. In some cases, you, you can indeed complete it in a symmetrical way. In other cases, there's no symmetry or no way to create a symmetrical image, which is also an important uh, uh, experience. But the notion of symmetry is learned in a constructive, hands-on manner. In this game, you know, we start with a log that has a certain length and with a saw, and then we begin sawing the log in order to create a rectangle that has a certain area or a certain uh, uh, circumference. And, uh, you know, like, like this answer here. Um, here's a game that teaches uh, folding and uh, three-dimensional uh, geometrical reasoning. And uh, here's a game in which we teach uh, uh, the notion of uh, sorting. Uh, so the child is operating some production line that uh, uh, puts together uh, chocolate boxes and uh, you have to sort them from less to more. You have to label them with numbers that uh, sort of stickers that say how many uh, pralines are in each box and so on. Once again, Everything is done in a hands-on, constructive manner. And, you know, here we mix colors and, uh, and so on and so forth. I'd like to end with this example in which we uh, try to teach uh, counting in, in a very specific way, in a very special way, I think, because we do it in kindergarten and first grade. And... I said counting, but that's not exactly what we try to teach here. What we try to teach is the beginning of quantitative reasoning in the following sense. So let me just describe the game. What we do is we show a field with a bunch of flowers, you know, uh, planted in this uh, field. And then we bring into the picture a swarm of bees. And there may be more bees than flower or less bees than flowers. And that's the whole point, because we ask the child to answer, what do you see more? Or do we have more bees or more flowers or an equal amount of bees and flowers? And the bees are kind of flying all over the place and it's difficult to count them. It's impossible actually to sort of put your finger and count uh, 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 the bees. But at some point you discover that if you take a bee, either with the, with the mouse or you know, on your phone, you can sort of drag it with your finger. If you take a bee and put it on a flower, like you see on the left uh, uh, side of this image, the flower opens up and the bee remains kind of hovering above the flower. So it becomes kind of stationary. And so that's the strategy. You associate bees with flowers and it at some point, you might realize that you covered all the flowers and there's still some bees flying around, or the other way around. You covered, uh, 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 used all the bees, so to speak, and there are still a few flowers which remain uncovered, in which case we have more flowers than bees. So what we teach here is several different things. You know, First of all, we teach the notions of more, less, equal, but we also sort of create the seed of the notion of what is known as bijective mapping, of taking you know, two sets of objects and creating a mapping between the objects in both sets. And it's very important to begin with these very basic concepts early on because they form a foundation to many you know, different uh, and more complicated ideas down the road. Here, you know, this uh, notion of bijective mapping or associating objects from, from two sets, this is the beginning of understanding the notion of a function that you know, the student may see for the first time maybe in uh, eighth grade or ninth grade or something like this, but when the student will see this notion of a function, you know, it is quite possible that this notion of bees and flowers that was learned several years earlier will kick in and, and you know, help understand, help 
create a smooth transition between something that was learned before to something which is learned now. Because once again, in mathematics, everything is connected. And you want to use these games in order to connect to ideas that you learned before and to more complicated ideas that will be learned subsequently. Now, it's, it may be obvious, but, but I should point out that creating any of these games is a lot of work because you, know, you need mathematicians and domain experts that understand the concepts you know, very deeply and can come up with good game ideas. Then you need instructional designers who will take these ideas and turn them into uh, uh, an effective uh, dialogue. Then you need uh, a game designer who will create something engaging and fun and playful. Then you need the uh, programmers to actually make it happen. Then you need to, de to do uh, usability testing with uh, a bunch of kids who play with these games and say, well, this is good, this is no good, and so on. And, and only then you can deploy the game and, and begin to fix all sorts of bugs that you didn't see before. So, you know, it takes a village to create every one of these games. Every one of these games is like a little product that goes through the whole cycle of uh, product definition, development, testing, and so on. And over the years, you know, this uh, uh, project uh, is now entering, I think, uh, the 10th year. So it took 10 years of, of hard work of about 50 developers to put together this portfolio of, uh, of games. Now, I'd like to begin to end with uh, this uh, quote from uh, Piaget, which I truly believe in. And Piaget said that whenever we teach children something, we take away forever the chance of discovering it for themselves. Now, that's a very profound insight. And Piaget said it because knowledge which is acquired by yourself is the most effective understanding or reaches you know the best sort of you understand the subject matter in the marrow of your bones because you, you actually you created the understanding in your own hands in a constructive hands-on fashion so instead of teaching something let's help children discovering these things on their own now, some children will do it quickly, others will do it, uh, will, will, will need more time. And therefore, we need both the teacher and the software to be very adaptive, to be very helpful, to, you know, kick in all sorts of uh, uh, tips and guidelines and, and help the child, you know, get out of, you know, uh, 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 various obstacles toward the right answer. And, you know, if the child gets stuck here and there, it's not the end of the world. It's okay. It's okay to feel some frustration. You know, it's part of, of life. But if you're frustrated and by doing something creative, you manage to get out of this frustration, it's a tremendous feeling of, of triumph. And, uh, and as, as you well know, you know, mathematics has a lot to do with self-confidence. And if you build a good mathematical uh, uh, skills, you contribute tremendously to the self-confidence of the child. You know, the confidence to tackle difficult problems and to, to have the upper hand. <clears throat> so to sum up, what we saw is a very small sample of uh, uh, the numerous games that we uh, developed. And in every one of these games, our goal is to build a conceptual understanding, a deep conceptual understanding of some mathematical uh, idea or technique or algorithm. We want to do so in an exploratory, hands-on constructive manner we want mathematics to be real. You know, we don't create any fantasies. We don't, uh, 
introduce uh, all sorts of new unrealistic uh, concepts. Everything is rooted in day-to-day -day, uh, scenes that children can easily relate to. We want to personalize these games so that children who take more time to see the light will get more iterations of the same game and more tips and more guidelines. And very importantly, we want to engage and empower. We want to, you know, we want the children to come out from these games feeling confident and accomplished. <clears throat> so looking back, you know, about two, three years ago, that's how classrooms uh, looked like. And uh, teachers used the Matific or our games in uh, uh, using uh, smart boards or computer screens and so on in, in a regular classroom. And today it becomes more like this. Uh, parents uh, uh, begin to be uh, much more active in the uh, 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 learning uh, setting. And I'm quite sure that in the future, both modes of, of teaching will, will prevail in, in some mix or another. So, you know, before everything was classroom centered and frontal teaching was uh, uh, predominant and, uh, you know, we used the computers in schools and parents were not an important part of the learning process. And uh, the emphasis was on teaching and learning, traditional teaching and learning. Today, you know, we want children to learn anywhere. It might be at their homes or in the community center or, you know, on the train. Uh, we want learning or I, I want learning or the, the group in which I work wants everything to be hands-on and concrete. Uh, using any device and any operating system uh, should, uh, uh, should lend itself to the learning materials. Parents are becoming increasingly more important. And uh, we found out that parents uh, actually enjoy playing our games together with their kids uh, because, you know, it brings back mathematics and uh, uh, it, uh, it becomes a game in which uh, parents and children play together and, and have a good time. And, uh, and it's not a meaningless game. It's a game that has a very important and concrete purpose. And uh, it's very important to engage both the students and the parents and the teachers and uh, give them a feeling of, uh, once again, playfulness and uh, an accomplishment. So thank you very much of your time. Uh, we have a few minutes for uh, questions. And uh, I guess that Anita will uh, kick in now, right? Yes, thank you so much, Iman. I think I uh, can safely say we all wish we would have learned mathematics from you and math mathematics methodology from you. Thank you. Um, so at Matific, we believe that math should be fun, engaging, and full of aha moments. We truly want all students, all children to love mathematics as much as we do. Uh, we offer thousands of K-6 highly interactive adaptive activities aligned to your local curriculum and available in over 40 languages. So great to support your ELL students and families. Our pedagogy is designed by world leading experts such as Shimon um, in math and elementary education. Each activity is carefully developed to be engaging and impactful on a student's math ability. And Matific students show significant gains in their academic achievement. And we have numerous research studies to support this. And we offer multiple avenues for teachers to enrich their classroom. You know, whether you're setting your students on an AI-driven individualized learning uh, journey, or you're carefully selecting uh, lessons and activities and assigning them to your students, we give you powerful tools uh, to, to help you assign the right work to the right students at the right time and truly um, impact and, and move forward with your math instruction, teaching and learning. And at Matific, we're always uh, 
innovating and improving the, um, the interface, the student experience, and with the help of students and educators and our expert academic board, um, as well as cutting edge research, we are introducing a brand new student experience coming in September. Um, our development team has been very hard at work to bring this to you. So um, we'll still have the same great Matific content, the same great teacher platform that teachers and students already love, but provide a much richer, more immersive, more interactive learning environment featuring original storylines and avatars that, that grow and mature with the students. Students will use their math skills in a story context to explore and earn achievements, navigate through challenges, and go on math adventures. Um, this personalized learning experience builds confidence in a fun and engaging manner. Uh, as I said before, we want all students, all children to love math as much as we do. And it's designed to help students tap into their own internal motivation to learn math. The gamification elements add a layer of extrinsic uh, motivation to keep the students engaged and, and excited to learn. Um, and I think one of the things that Matific has always done really, really well, and as Shimon said, we're going into our 10th year here with Matific, is striking a really nice balance between um, pedagogy, conceptual understanding, and gamification. You know, there's a lot of math programs out there that are very gamey and don't have a lot of math. And then there's a lot of math programs that have an awful lot of math, very sound pedagogy, but they're kind of dull and boring for your students. You know, we want, I think we do a really nice job of striking a balance between the two, between gamification and the, and the pedagogy. And you can get started today. A lot of you were asking this question in the chat uh, with a full access 30 day trial at matific.com. If you're on the web, it'll automatically update to the new student experience when we release that next week. Actually, we're probably gonna be a few days early releasing it, releasing Sunday, August 29th, August 29th. Um, and so you'll automatically update to the new student experience. If you are planning to use a mobile app, either Android or iOS, I suggest that you maybe wait till next week so that you're not having to deal with updates. And now for the Q&A. Um, so I think that answered a bunch of your questions. Uh, there was a question about grade levels. It's aligned to K-6 curriculum, uh, Common Core and many other state standards. Uh, what else? Um, what devices we work on? Virtually anything. Um, as long as it's relatively modern, we'll work on any device. And then there were quite a few questions around, um, you know, classrooms that don't necessarily use computers all the time and suggestions for games done on the floor or table using more of a hands-on format. So kind of striking a balance between that hands-on and the digital. And Shimon, do you have any commentary on that, particularly at the younger grades? Hands-on versus digital. Yeah, uh, it will be great. It could have been great if uh, you could uh, learn mathematics using physical objects. And yet, uh, when you think about our games, you realize that it's quite difficult to bring uh, into uh, the classroom all the boats and airplanes and trains and fruits and vegetables and, and, and whatnot that we use in our games. So it's not, it's not realistic to expect uh, teachers to be able to use uh, too many props in their classrooms. And at some point, you run out of physical metaphors and you need much more to drive in the mathematical concepts. So we believe in digital simulation. Uh, we think that they are very powerful and uh, effective. Awesome. Uh, there is another question around, do the students, or sorry, do the games give the student immediate feedback? And how do we, how do we address immediate feedback in the games? Yeah, we uh, spend a lot of time with our uh, game designers to create an ongoing feeling of progress, of positive uh, progress. So, for example, after every correct answer, you get uh, sort of an explosion of stars, which will children really love. And uh, you begin to accumulate all sorts of uh, trophies and uh, and prizes on, on the side of the screen, uh, on the envelope of the game. So absolutely, we provide ongoing feedback. 
Thank you very much for attending. We really appreciate your time. I know this is a super hectic time in the school year. So appreciate you taking the hour to be with us. I hope you learned something today. And Shimon, thank you so much for presenting. It was wonderful. Okay. And any questions at all, don't hesitate to email me, anita at matific.com. Thanks so much, everyone.